Welcome to the Charles Lewis Davis Foundation Legends of Veterinary Pathology. I'm Timothy O'Neill. I'm the Chief of the Registry of Comparative Pathology, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Today it's uh, my pleasure and a distinct honor to have Dr. Charles A. Montgomery as our guest uh, to interview today. Dr. Montgomery is a legend in veterinary pathology and has been in the field for well over 30 some years now. I also have Dr. Milton April with me, who is a good friend and, and a laboratory animal veterinarian who has known Chuck for many years. As a matter of fact, the, the two of them began their, together in the Army in the, in the uh, late 60s. So what I'd like to do is, is uh, uh, go through some of your history, Dr. Montgomery, and uh, if you don't mind, I'll just call you Chuck. Sure. I know you better by that. <clears throat> you, uh, you're from Oklahoma originally. I'm very proud to be an Okie. I'm very proud to be an Okie. Uh, I'm going to go through some of your academic credentials here in a minute, but can you tell me a little bit about where you were born and raised? And I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, my, because my dad was an electrician and followed the construction jobs, we moved around a lot in my early life to Texas, Louisiana, Kansas City. And and then we keep we kept migrating back to Tulsa every once in a while, but uh, I was born in the Flower Hospital, Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is no longer there. And you went to sc you did your undergraduate school in in Oklahoma as well. You did you went to Eastern uh, Oklahoma Tech uh, A and M, and then you also went to Oklahoma State where you got your bachelor's degree. Right. And then from there you went to to the uh, veterinary school at Oklahoma State. Can you tell me what persuaded you to, to go into veterinary medicine? Well, to be in, in all honesty, it was my second choice. When I was a young man, I used to uh, watch everything there was and read everything there was on the United States Navy. And I really wanted to be a submarine commander. Now, how I got that idea of being in the middle of Oklahoma, I still wonder about. But, um, Based on that, though, I made an early decision to go to the United States Naval Academy and prepared <coughs> quite well to, to do that. I took, I went to high school in Jay, Oklahoma, which a very small town, so they, the school did not offer a lot of the courses that were necessary to, to take the test to get into the academy. So I, I went to summer school and took world history. In fact, I took two courses at the same time, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And I took courses uh, at a junior college at Miami, Oklahoma. And then some of my teachers actually gave me courses for credit in things like civics, government, and things like that. I needed an appointment to be able to go to the school and my grandfather was uh, very active in politics and knew Senator Robert S. Kerr quite well. And Dr. Kerr, I mean, Senator Kerr gave, allowed me to have a third alternate position. That meant that the first two had to flunk the test, and that happened. So I took the test, and I passed it with flying colors, and then when it came time to, to take my physical examination, I, they flunked me. I was um, underweight for my height, had overgrown cuticles and acne, and that prevented me from being accepted by the United States Naval Academy. And up to, up to that point, I'd really never had any major failures in life, so I took that pretty hard. And all, during that whole period, I, I stayed in, actively involved in vocational agriculture and um, the future farmers of America. I was very active in that. So my uh, vocational agriculture teacher came out to the house and, when I was kind of feeling bad and said, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I'm not sure. He said, well, have you ever considered <coughs> veterinary medicine? 
He said, I've been watching you now for the last five years. And he said, you do have a knack with animals. And you won the tractor driving contest. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, that's not a bad idea. But I'll test myself. I'll work on a ranch this summer and see if I want to do this. So I worked for the college farm at Eastern A&M at Wilberton, Oklahoma, and delivered calves and treated fr fractured legs and Holstein calves. And, and uh, back in those days, we still had screw worms in Oklahoma. That was a major problem in newborn calves because they get into the umbilicus. And I made a decision and by the end of that summer to start in pre-veterinary medicine. And, and I never stopped. Here I am. And then <laughs> on to veterinary school. Well, that's a, I, I, I wanted you to kind of give us a little background because from, from that point on, you've had a very distinguished career in veterinary medicine, both in, in veterinary pathology and in laboratory animal medicine. And I noticed that you had uh, practiced for a few years after mm. graduation. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. I'm a, I'm a strong believer that veterinary pathologists or people that are interested in going into veterinary pathology do better if they have practiced. When I was at, when I ran the, the preceptorship program in veterinary pathology at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, we would get maybe 40 applicants a year. And that's the first thing I did. I, I looked at their curriculum body and determine whether they were, had practiced or not. <clears throat> and I put them into two stacks. If I could possibly pick people that had been in practice, I did. And to be honest with you, Dr. Garner, when, it, when he chose me as the first preceptee the, in the United States Army Veterinary Pathology Program, picked me because I had been in practice. He told me that later. Your, your career spans both the United States Army, the United States Public Health Service, I have numerous academic appointments, and, and also private industry as well. Uh, I'd like to start with the Army, if I could. That's the, the, the area that uh, Milt probably knows the best about and can probably... Uh, yeah, well, I was drafted into the Army. You were, you were drafted? I was drafted into the Army out of practice, which was a pretty traumatic event. Um, I had built a very nice practice with, had a equine orthopedic surgery practice and doing quite well financially. And, uh, and Uncle Sam called. And Uncle Sam called. But if you go back and look at the history of the presidential draft, it, they've, they've only instituted it a couple of three times. True. And in 1966, they, they did it for the Vietnam. General Year. Hershey. Right. Yeah. So, physicians, dentists, and veterinarians in Oklahoma were drafted and had to be, I had to report to active duty at Fort Sam Houston in about 22 days. And, in, and during that time, I sold my practice in 22 days. In 22 days. I sold my practice in three days. It must have been very good practice. It was a very good practice. Still there. And then your, your first assignment was in Pine Bluff? Or was that uh, Well, I, actually, I had orders to go to Presidio San Francisco as a food inspector. And there was a, a when I got to Fort Sam Houston, um, there was a Colonel Davis, who was uh, the senior veterinarian at that time there. And on the, fir and on the first day, he, he came in and introduced himself and said, if anybody's not um, doesn't care for their assignment, let me know. So I made an appointment and went to see him. And, and I basically told him that I didn't want to inspect food. I would rather do something in the research and development field. And, it, and part of my, in part of my practice, I was, on a, very, I was a member of an experimental surgery team at Hillcrest Medical Center and had done quite a bit of thoracic surgery and open heart surgery and things like that. So I. I felt maybe he could use, the Army could use me that way. And there, at that time, there was a unit out, out in California that was doing experimental surgery, but, you know, everybody wanted that job. So I went to see him, and he said, well, I'll see what I can do. 
And uh, three days later, I had orders to Pine Bluff Arsenal. I went over to the library at Fort Sam Houston. They had an, a book on every assignment. Pine Bluff Arsenal wasn't in there. <laughs> <laughs> Why might that be, Chuck? Uh, it was the it was a top secret post where one end of the post they were filling white phosphorus into one to howitzer shells and grenades, and at the other end of the post was the production center for the United States Army for biological warfare agents. So I had a top secret crypto clearance from the time I came into the Army. That facility has since been closed. In it was closed by Nixon. In 1974, I believe. And uh, is now the National Center for Toxicological yeah. Research right. under the Food and Drug Administration. So that was your first exposure to laboratory animals as well? It sure was. They, they did not teach us much about rats and mice and monkeys at Oklahoma State University's Veterinary School. I think that's different today. In fact, I know, know it is. They have a full-time laboratory animal medicine ACLAM diplomate on their faculty now. No, I thought a rat was a big mouse. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a very interesting place because uh, we had up to 200 monkeys at a time. Um, I can't remember, something like 200,000 mice, 15, 20,000 guinea pigs, goats, geese, chickens, anything you could make antibodies in. And it's, it's an experience to get 200 monkeys in from India in one shipment. Yes, I'm sure. It's had a great impact on veterinary pathology, the, the change in primate uh, sources. As, of course, Dr. Ape is an authority on that. But in those days, when you, when you brought the monkeys in, they, you basically did a triage. They would, be, they would come in with multiple animals in one shipping container. So the ones that had monkey bites or had torn their skin or had cuts and bruises and cuts, they went over in one direction for surgery. The ones that had respiratory disease went another direction. The ones that had diarrhea went in another direction. And of course you had to tattoo all those animals and do physical examinations on them. And, and it took about 18 hours of solid work from the time that they arrived to our, at our facility to the time that we c I could go have more than one cup of coffee. Sort of an 18-hour triage, you think. That was, well, that you prepared you for Vietnam, mm -hmm. though, a little it, it bit was later a, on. It was a good experience for Vietnam. Yeah, it prepared. Uh, I just wanted to, to mention, if I haven't mentioned already, uh, Dr. Montgomery is not only board certified in veterinary pathology, he's also board certified in laboratory animal medicine and is a, a distinguished uh, person in that field as well. Uh, why don't you ask him about the Army, Milt, and see what uh, you said you had, as I heard something about nurses upstairs. Oh, I would, I would. No, I, we wouldn't do that. Um, no, I think, uh, as I remember, uh, Chuck and I met back in our Army days. Uh, I was stationed at uh, Walter Reed after I'd come back from overseas, and I think uh, Chuck had uh, two. And we used to get together and have some beers and talk over some old war stories and so forth. And uh, uh, the, the nursing pun there was the, the rain students where they used to have uh, uh, trained nurses uh, had a very um, uh, well-known um, nursing school here at uh, Walter Reed, which has uh, since um, left. But um, the, uh, the thing was is, is when, you know, we were never... Um, we never lost the ability to, to, to get a date. You could walk into the to the nursing uh, school and, and ask if uh, any of the young ladies wanted to go out. And of course, all we were going to do was take them across the street to the office. Certainly, right, and I understand. You know, but, uh, we, we had to, Milton, because we didn't have yeah, any we money. Didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, um, we have a lot of uh, stories like that, but I guess getting more back into the professional mode, uh, we, um, we met and, and we had um, done some things uh, in the Army together. Uh, Chuck was uh, um, a pathologist uh, uh, at that time and, and um, uh, incidentally uh, and coincidentally, um, I had uh, met my uh, future wife 
at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. She was working in there in the museum and, and uh, at the same time that uh, Chuck and I were kind of working together. So it, it goes back, we have a lot of memories together and, and um, uh, did a lot of good, good things. Um, um, Chuck uh, um, asked me if I wanted to get uh, interested in uh, pathology. I really never thought I was smart enough to be a pathologist um, and I still feel that way. So I went into uh, laboratory animal medicine, as you know, we had to... Uh, well, that's no simple task. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I studied well, for those boards, too. No, uh, tell you and what, I, and I no think, uh, I think uh, you know, if I had any influence on Chuck, he had a great deal on me. Um, and he did uh, kind of coerce me to think about that, and, and I, I did some work for him when he was uh, chief of pathology over at uh, Uniform Services and, and used to work out at one of his labs and help him put his uh, seminars and, and uh, series together and, and study slides because I was going to go either, either way, uh, but with uh, Chuck's um, uh, armamentarium of, of uh, slides and grow slides and so forth, I, I think I saw everything that, that could be seen. So. Um, it's quite a collection. It's quite a collection, and and so we started thinking and talking, and and um, I guess my influence was is rather than me becoming a pathologist, why don't you become a laboratory there you go. That's veterinarian, you know? And I, I think, think that's you'll an have more fun, strategy. and, and uh, you know, and so he has the <laughs> <laughs> prestige of of uh, having uh, both boards. Um, uh, the tremendous value of that is is I always liked uh, pathology made my best grades in veterinary school with uh, pathology and just saw that it was a, a tremendous um, interesting um, area and I agree with Chuck that uh, if you know pathology, you know medicine, you know veterinary medicine, if you, you can go back and, and kind of think your way through just about anything. The, the uh, um, good part or the funny part about that is that when we went to take our, our uh, laboratory animal boards, we probably knew more pathology than and the people that were given it or whatever. I mean, we'd seen everything and, and done a lot. And, and one of the things I remember about Chuck, I was, I was, we were about, oh, I don't know, 80% through the, through the practical part, which uh, was a lot of pathology and a lot of slides and gross stuff. I mean, you know, you can't get laboratory animal veterinarians to look at any micro stuff because they, they couldn't even understand the language. <laughs> but. Um, uh, I looked over at Chuck, and, and of course he's he put his pencil down. And he says, "I'm through." I, I said, "What are you doing?" He said, uh, "I've answered enough. I got them all." So you know, it's you know a lot of confidence, you know, back then. <laughs> but you know, and and the other thing too, we were looking at slides that uh, we had already turned in, you know, for the year or the previous year because we didn't know exactly when we were going to be taking this this uh, test. So we were looking at some slides that. Uh, that Chuck had turned in, you know, to be quizzed on, and and I think we were the only two or our study know. group that they got them right four. because one of them was a was a uh, monkey swinging through the trees that it impaled himself on some big oh, limb, Lord. and here's a piece of wood sitting right in the middle of a lung, and and the question was is is you know what what's the what is the the animal give me you know a, a near resemblance of the species, and what do you think the pathology is? Well, my gosh. You know, <laughs> that's that's pretty tough. That's pretty tough. Yeah, there were newer monkeys uh, often got thorns. These great yeah. big thorns. South American and species. They, and they would migrate. The thorns would migrate. <coughs> I found I found them in the pericardial sac several times. That's an interesting. That was mostly <coughs> in the South American, the New World species. Right. Right. Let's digress for a moment. Let's go back to um, you. You you were at Pine Bluff acting basically in the capacity of a laboratory animal veterinarian. That's, that's true. And pathologist and everything I, In else. fact, uh, the person that I replaced there was Steve Pakes, who is a very senior member of ACLAM, very distinguished comparative medicine expert. He's been at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas for 22 years. He likes to tell the story that that he talked me into staying in the Army and going for training in pathology, and then he got out of the Army. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, you're, you, you went from Pine Bluff, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, to, to the AFIP in 1968. Right. right. They, they, formed, they formed the, the Veterinary Pathology Preceptorship Program. 
at that time. And I had uh, come to the conclusion at that point, I, I had three kids, all small, and I, I'd come to the conclusion that I did not think I wanted to go back into practice. Uh, Milt knows that once you leave practice, it's very difficult to come back and start over again because yeah. you basically, financially and every other way, you have to start all over again. And it um, takes a while to do that and get, get back up to the where you were before. It costs a lot of money to do that. Interestingly, not to cut you off, we talked about that several times. About That's right going into the practice or going back into practice well, you're because we on. thought we had the expertise and could, you know, still, you know, practice our, our uh, particular fields. In fact, we thought maybe we could make some kind of specialty out of it. And, mm -hmm. and we both, uh, after a while, had, had uh, uh, talked through this thing or discussed it well enough that, no, we really didn't want to go back into it. The financial obligations were pretty stiff. We might wake up one day and decide we really don't want to do this. Um, and the fact that I think we had the, the, um, uh, the luck of being um, stationed in and around a mecca for biomedical research and, and the opportunities for continuing education in laboratory animal medicine and pathology were just tremendous and at that particular time. And laboratory animal medicine really was sort of in its, um, Infancy. I'd say, well, I was, I was going to say childhood, I think. Well, the, yeah, not, yeah, childhood is closer. You know, I think, I, think, uh, I believe in 66, ALAS was the animal care, called the Animal Care Panel. I went to my first National American Association of Laboratory Animal Science meeting in 1966 in Chicago. When you, when you did your residency here at the AFIP, who was um, the chairman of the Department of Veterinary Pathology? Was it Dick Garner? Dr. F. M. Garner. Mm -hmm. Dick. And I call him Dick now, but it, it, I called, and him, how was I called that? him sir then. How was that, uh, how was that residency oh, back I, there, was, the, the was, Wednesday slide conference in particular? It was I, tough. I mean, it, <clears throat> those days are, were really great. Um, Dr. Garner uh, is a wonderful guy, brilliant pathologist, and, but he had an, some other very strong attributes. He was a World War II veteran. Right, an infantry uh, and yeah, in the officer. In the infantry, mm -hmm. and wounded multiple times. In fact, one time he told me he was laying in a hospital bed and the Germans attacked and he got shot in the foot while he was laying in bed. He said, those guys were actually trying to get me. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> might believe um, that. But Dr. Garner, because of his strong combat arms experience, was very well disciplined, and he expected his officers to be disciplined, to take care of their uniform, to shine their brass, and to shine their shoes. And but he, he didn't have to tell me that because I, I took pride in my army uniform. I'd like to digress just on about that for a second. When I was at Pine Bluff Arsenal. It was one of the smallest army posts in the world. There were, um, let's see, I believe there were 20, 27 officers, one full colonel, one lieutenant colonel, and one major, the rest of the captains, lieutenants, and 54 enlisted personnel, and 1,300 civilians. Very small post. And The, the, the uh, post was so small that we could only have one physician on post. And uh, Dr. Harley Blank was our physician. And we couldn't afford a dentist. They sent, a fort, sent him from Fort Polk about four times a year. We had one attorney and one veterinarian. You know, had for, to have an attorney. Yeah. But uh, Dr. Blank, um, like many physicians that were drafted into the Army back in those days, didn't really care about his uniform and his shoes and what he looked like. He, and one day, he and I were on a committee together at the officers club that dealt with uh, social functions. 
And I walked in one day with my brass shining and my Corpam sho shoes that you could see see your face in. And, and uh, he said, oh, you, you always look so strack. He said, uh, you, you'd think you were in the infantry, not in the veterinary corps. And I said, well, Dr. Blank, I said, I'm, I'm really proud to be an, an Army officer. You were even drafted, too. Yeah, yeah. But, but I'm the first Montgomery man to serve in the military since the Civil War. So that, it, and my, my dad was not accepted into the, any of the branches of the service when, when Pearl Harbor occurred. Everybody went down to join. And they wouldn't take my dad because he only weighed 116 pounds. He even Boy. tried, he, the, even the Seabees wouldn't take him. It seems to run <laughs> in the family, underweight, yeah. Yeah. So, or well, then, back then. Yeah, back know. in those days, anyway. But, um, so when I got drafted, my dad was proud. Well, there's some irony there. You couldn't volunteer and get into the Navy, but when they needed you, they drafted you and put you in the Army. That's right. And he turns out to be the most squared yeah. away soldier in the whole there unit. There you go. That's right. And, you but go. I was warm. You know, when they did yeah. the physical, when you get drafted and yeah. do the physical, yeah. you know, that's when they they uh, auscultate you with the with without having things in their ears. You know. Yeah. Well, I but, yeah. Uh, been, been there, done that. Mm -hmm. but Bend it, over and spread your cheeks. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, Forty at a time. You know, in a row. <laughs> I remember that. I yeah. remember that quite well. But I I told uh, Doctor Blank that since he was going to get out of the Army and go into an OBGYN residency, that he really should take better care of his uh, appearance. That some of the wives on post didn't particularly care about going to see him because he, he didn't, he looked kind of rumpled all the time. Well, he took that seriously. The next time I saw him, he, he had his uniform laundered and his brass shined up. And, uh, but I, I, I've always been proud of about my uniform. The, ir the irony of what, of, of what you mentioned a while ago about trying to get into the Navy and not being able to get into, but later in my becoming a Public Health Service Commission Corps officer and wearing a uniform that looks mm -hmm. like a Navy uniform. Yeah, and a captain at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and became captain. Yeah. You know. And then, and then we'd, we'd get on some submarines once in a while, too. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. so they would got on your submarine. Yeah, pipe us right on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so who, they wouldn't know. Tell me who are some of the other residents that were here at the time with you. Well, let, let's, let's and, and when they started the preceptorship program, they decided to do it at Denver, Fitzsimmons Hospital, Fort Detrick, Maryland, Edgewood Arsenal, and the AFIP. I was the first preceptee, and they gave me a choice, and I and I wanted Fitzsimmons. Um, that's in Denver. It, yeah. Dr. Thompson had been there, you know. Uh, it was a good good place and it was close to Oklahoma. I got a telephone call from the uh, Veterinary Corps office and they said, we think you should reconsider your choice of assignments. And I said, why? And they said, well, Colonel Garner, who actually wrote the preceptorship program, has personally requested you at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. An honor. And I said, why? And he said, because he likes the fact that you're older, been in practice, and a little bit more mature. So I, I did it. The best thing I ever did was come into the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. I think a lot of us have said that very same thing. It's a wonderful place. I still have a very fond place in my heart for it. I'm proud to be an alumnus. Well, the AFIP is proud to have you as well, Chuck. Um, again, who, who, who were the residents? Who were the residents at the time? Well, they, they, they at the time that they chose me for to come here, they chose Jim Mo and Gary Dill. Okay. And they went to Fort Detrick, but they they started their, I believe they started their training like in the fall, and I started mine in July. Uh, here, um, Shelly Diamond came in in the Air Force about the same time mm -hmm. that I did. The, the chief resident was uh, Alex DiPoli. He was my first mentor. 
and he was a good one. He taught me to talk with my hands. He's Italian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, I can't remember everybody, but it... it um, was Dick Brown there at the same time? Was well, Dick Brown was studying for his boards. Yeah. There was a group, there was a group of pathologists that, that were studying for their boards in, I believe, 1966 or 67. Doc, Dr. Gene McConnell, who later became my boss at the mm -hmm. National Toxicology Gene Program. McConnell, right. Um, Jim, Jim Stuckey. Jim Stuckey, he's out Alex here in Tapoli, town. Alex Tapoli and uh, several of them. Several mm -hmm. of them. There, I think there were five or six that were studying for their boards. And that was a great opportunity for a new resident because they, these people were, would go back where, the, where we, the photographs were stored and look at gross photographs every day at lunch. And they kind of had still do. They and still do. They, they kind of have an un, they had an unwritten rule though. If you're a resident, you couldn't speak. You just listen. And that's basically how I, I read read Jeb and Kennedy's book. I would go I would go into those study sessions for the senior people every day. And when they would mention some disease that I didn't know anything about, I would write it down. And I still have that notebook. Every time I get a little cocky. I go back and look at my notebook and realize how stupid I was when I started my residency. We all think we all think we have a, a yeah. head up on this thing, and then when you get here, and we realize how much we don't know. Oh. It's not a matter of just brushing and, up uh, or and, and it's worse, notes. And it's worse today because now we have molecular everything. You know, one has to be really on. You top. really have. Can you kind of recount some of what what it was like during the Wednesday slide conference at this period of time? <coughs> Just sort of the typical. Well, I can remember when the George when George. When and the, I remember the when atmosphere. George. You know, George. I actually, actually, when I came here, uh, Ray Reed, who was the was what, head of the was, national had to do a job that you have. Oh, I see. Right, right. Yeah, and Ray, and then right after that, George McGaughy came. I remember George McGaughy saying that when he studied for the boards, Charlie Barron was still here? Mm -hmm. Yes. He idolizes Charlie Barron. I know. And, well, everybody that knew Charlie did. I mean, he was, he was a great pathologist. I went, I, I went to Charlie Barron's funeral. It was, he was a good friend. But um, Charlie was tough. He, was, he just ate residents for lunch. And he loved to uh, kind of sucker you into a feeling of, you know, safe, safeness, and then drop a question on you that it blows your mind. And uh, he did that to Shelly Diamond several times, and, uh, and Shelly had to leave the room because he got nauseated. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, Dr. McGaughy said that just thinking about coming to the Wednesday slide conference with Dr. Barron in it made him throw up before he left My the United States Department of Agriculture job that he was in. But it, it, in those days, it was very disciplined. I, I was, one of my jobs when I was here was to run the Wednesday slide conference. Mm -hmm. I did too. One you year. did too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they only picked the best guys for that. <laughs> well, I heard that. Yes. <laughs> That's I heard that. Mm -hmm. Or the ones, the ones that don't argue. But. Um, I enjoyed that. I learned a lot from that. But it was very disciplined, and the, the subject of anatomy and physiology was the beginning of the discussion. What is this tissue? Why? How does it differ from this species? That was part of the Wednesday slide conference. It's not enough of that. Oh, it's not enough of it today. Everything's based on the normal. I know. See, I didn't. I didn't have any pressure when I went because I was just invited and I'd sit there and listen. I'm telling you, they. But were, you learn a lot in listening. You do. You, know? oh, you do. It's a good review. And one of the one of the funny things I like to talk tell about is you know uh, we have a lot of funny things to talk about, but uh, this is kind of a, a good funny thing is that when I was helping Chuck and and helping myself try to learn and so forth, I'd be putting these series together for some. Uh, classes or seminars he'd be given uh, over at uh, AFIP or USIS and, and like I said I knew him quite well didn't have to go back and study him but I sometimes would go down on the on the front row rather than sitting in the back and I, I kind of was casually sitting on the front row one morning and and it was a very fairly serious class of of uh, uh, people trying to learn pathology and 
I was sitting there and I, I wasn't taking any notes and I was kind of relaxed and so forth. And after a while, uh, one of these gentlemen looked over and they said, um, and I was kind of um, um, mouthing uh, the diagnosis. Uh, diagnosis and so forth because I'd heard it so many times and was just kind of listening again. And, and they kind of caught on to this. And when they would take notes and say, well, you know, kind of miss something. They'd say, what was that? And I would tell them. <laughs> Fill them in. And then, and then finally they said, uh, uh, are, are you a pathologist? Or, I mean, you seem to know this, this uh, pretty well. And I said, no, nah, I could never learn all this. I'm a laboratory animal veterinarian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of blew them away. We, we, we laugh a lot about that. <laughs> but uh, it, the Wednesday slide conference back in those days, uh, you you had better be prepared when you came into that room because you'd be chastised if you did not. And um, I, I really feel that when you're teaching pathology that you have to have a discipline. You have to set goals and meet goals and you have to be thick-skinned be, because a good teacher is going to correct you if you're wrong. Now, how that's done varies between individual teachers. Um, there's my approach, and which kind of fits John King's and Roger Panzer's approach. Um, th I, there's a gentle side of me that when I'm working with a student that's having trouble grasping pathogenesis and things like that, that I can work them through it at a pace that they're comfortable with. But that's, 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 that's what a good teacher does. A good teacher takes the student's attributes and works from them and massages them and brings them out to become a good pathologist. Works the other way. If they, if they do not have what it takes to be a pathologist, they shouldn't be there. And I have kicked people out of residency programs. So the, the Wednesday slide conference was a fairly traumatic experience then for you. Oh, yeah. After, after you did your residency, you got sent off to Vietnam. How'd that happen? Is, is you, well, I mean, I, it, it, had you volunteered or? Before, before you go there, can oh, I sorry. say something? Oh, sorry, please. Right. Well, no, I wanted to say something um, in regards to, uh, we've all had a lot of professors and teachers and so forth. Um, I think Chuck um, was a, a, a born teacher. I don't, I don't know if he realizes that. I think some people have the knack for it and uh, um, the understanding and, and certainly, you know, the character to look into uh, other people and, and have a uh, kind of an understanding of, of how their, their learning is uh, coming along. But um, one of the things that we realized uh, when we were studying laboratory animal medicine and had to know uh, back then a considerable amount of, of pathology that, that Chuck was a, a tremendous teacher and not only for us in, in that particular uh, study group and for what he did um, uh, around here and, and so forth. But we would actually follow him to certain uh, university systems that were close by because um, of his uh, uh, ability to, uh, to teach and, and uh, grasp uh, how uh, that student audience uh, needed to, to know something. And I, I think it's a real... Um, attribute uh, to his uh, character and personality because I don't think you can teach somebody to be that way and and I've always uh, um, recognized that uh, in Chuck and I think a lot of my uh, peers and colleagues have, have done that and I think there's a lot of people out there that when we uh, are talking and mention uh, uh, Chuck and what he has done and the things that he has taught us and so forth always go back to the fact that he, he was just a a tremendous uh, uh, teacher and, and innovator. And one of the things um, uh, that when he was teaching uh, us as laboratory animal veterinarians goes back to his past as a, as a practitioner and, and being more than a pathologist because he knew how to relate and interrelate a lot of these things and diseases that we would see and have to deal with and so forth. Uh, not as, uh, as pathologists per se, but certainly as, as uh, uh, qualified clinicians to be able to at least describe what the uh, circumstance was to a pathologist so that she could get that background and help. And one of the things else that he taught us to do was to think on our feet. 
because he would put us up in front of uh, the slide or our group and so forth and, and not embarrass you, but at least, you know, it, we got to the point where, you know, uh, having that thick skin and, and being able to um, talk on our feet and, and think on our feet. And I think before that, we didn't have that. So I just wanted to, to digress in that because, uh, quite frankly, I've wrote a couple uh, uh, recommendations uh, for Chuck, not that, not that he needed my recommendation, but, uh, uh, and in there, I would always say that, that uh, I, I feel that uh, Chuck was a, a born, born teacher, you know, and of course you have to have the knowledge and background to teach the subject, and I think that's always a, uh, a real example of somebody that knows the subject, somebody that can, uh, can teach it. So I just wanted to, to mention yeah, that. Thank you. I would agree with that, too. I've attended numerous lectures that you've given, uh, Chuck, and I mean, they've just been superior in every aspect in terms of the quality and the content. And I'd also like to say, too, you were held as a role model here at the AFIP when I was in residency, even that was almost 10 years later when I was here at the AFIP in residency, and you were held as a role model, and oftentimes the chairman would say, why don't you be like Chuck Montgomery, you know? <laughs> I didn't really know him. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you be like Chuck Montgomery? Well, that's that. Um, those are kind words. I appreciate that. So they shipped you out to to Vietnam. Oh from, yeah. From here. Um, there was a period. There, was, there was a period of time when they were doing construction work here at the AFIP that um, they moved the whole veterinary pathology department down to the old Bureau of Standards building. That was kind of nice. They had lots. They had windows. You know, we, we were in the sub-sub-sub basement here at mm -hmm. FIP, and we had no windows. During that time, I was, I became senior resident, and um, I went in and talked to Dr. Garner. I said, am I going to Vietnam? And he said, well, I've thought about that a lot. And he said, no. He said, I want to put your mind at ease, because Christmas was coming up. And I said, put, I want to put your mind at ease. You're, you're going to stay here another year and you can study for the boards and and uh, you won't go to Vietnam the next year. So I went home and told my family that I was not going to Vietnam, but I was going to be around for another year. So then they picked another officer to go to the 9th Medical Lab in Long Bend, Vietnam and uh, to replace Dr. Mike Stedham, who was over there at that time. Mm -hmm. I remember Mike. Mm -hmm. And uh, that officer's wife had a nervous breakdown. I mean, really serious. So the veterinary corps said, well, we won't, we won't send him to Vietnam because his wife's ill. So they came back. Mm. Right before Christmas. Right at Christmas. Right at Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. You're going to Vietnam. And that was a shock because I, I'd, ar mm -hmm. I'd already kind of resolved the fact I wasn't going to go that year, you know. And so it was hard on my family. I'm sure it but was. Three children. Yeah, I moved them, I moved them back to Oklahoma while Small I was gone. Small children. Yeah. So I went, I went to Vietnam and people can say what they want to about Vietnam, but from a professional standpoint, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I did 104 human autopsies. I saw that. I read over 2,000 surgical biopsies, human, human surgical biopsies, plus all the animal biopsies. I got heavily involved with the drug detection program there and learned a lot of chemistry. I did a lot of civic action work out in the jungle setting up swine production programs and egg laying programs for villages, except Milton knows that. It doesn't succeed very well if they eat the hens. That's true. <laughs> That's, that happens. happens you, go back, you go back a month later, you know, just to check on them and there's no chickens. Yeah, particularly if you're trying to buy food for the army. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had some bad things happen to me in Vietnam and, and uh, I went down. I went down three times in choppers and survived all three. I was the only survivor the third time. Mm. Um, I, I lived in a hooch in Long Bend, and I was the only medical type guy 
and the hooch. There were 13 guys that belonged to the CIDs, Current Criminal Investigation mm -hmm. Division, and they were over there on a special task force to uh, investigate stolen brass. Pe there were people who were taking 155 howitzer shells and melting them down and making brass bullion, mm -hmm. and then they would sell it back to, to the enemy or give it to them, and then we'd actually had people shooting at us with uh, reloaded shells that they'd stolen. But anyway, um, the year I was in Vietnam, I lost 34 friends, 11 of them one night. 11 of those 13 men died in one night. A rocket attack? No. The, the Koreans were involved with a uh, theft situation where the, the material that was coming in for the PX, PX system mm -hmm. was being actually stolen before it ever got off-boarded from the ship, but, and they were just switching it over to a Korean ship. And they, they boarded that ship that night, and somebody blew the whistle on them before they got there, and then the, the Koreans knew they were coming. So it's I had that. an organized crime. It was, it, it was organized crime. But that was rough because we only had 20, 20 people living in that hooch and 11 of them died in one night. Half I, of the population, yeah. better than half of the population. First day I lived in that hooch, we had a mortar attack. I knew what the war was about, I'll tell you that. And I've never been able to go to the wall downtown because of that. I just I don't think I'm ready yet. It's difficult for many, many Vietnam veterans. But from a professional standpoint, it was, uh, you know, you couldn't beat working in an air-conditioned building, doing pathology most of the time I was there. Learned a lot. Uh, and I, I saw Dr. Norm Reem last night here. He, he was General, General Reem retired, but he, uh, he was with me over there and we were recounting some of the cases that we saw. Um, most of the cases that came, the human cases that came into that laboratory were non-traumatic deaths. Those cases went elsewhere. So the ones that were suspected drug involved, suicides, infectious diseases, came to the Knife Med Lab. So in one year, I saw typhus, uh, several internal parasite problems, uh, several cases of malaria-induced death, mm -hmm. some of which was related to immunosuppression from the fact they were on heroin. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of mycotic infections that went systemic. And I would see the same type of mycotic infections in the dogs that I need cross. Meliodosis mm -hmm. yep. in Southeast Asia. That's right, meliodosis and uh, phycomycosis. Mm -hmm. So it, it, was a, it was a good experience for me. It took me a while to get become normal after I came back from Vietnam. I don't think you really became completely no. normal. I may not be I completely normal that. yet. <laughs> I, I, some people say I haven't grown up yet. <laughs> or what are you going to be? Yeah, what, do I, what am I going to do when I grow up? But it was a good experience and uh, You do a lot of growing up when you're away from halfway around the world. Yeah. You learn uh, that you can't always rely on people, that survival is really your decision and, and God's. Amen. So when I, when I was over there, um, I started getting letters from Dr. Paul Hildebrandt. Okay. And I pick it up okay. on the next tape. Welcome back to the Charles Lewis Davis Foundation series, Legends in Veterinary Pathology. We're continuing our interview with Dr. Charles A. Montgomery, or Chuck Montgomery as, as he's known in, in the veterinary pathology field. We were just finishing up with uh, your tour in Vietnam 
and uh, you were you said that you had communicated with some people back in the states as to what your right. assignment would be when you came back. Well, I, I had not passed. I had not taken the ACVP exam because of my inter interruption in, at the end of my residency. So I was looking for a place that I could go back and study, and also just stay there and and, and uh, for my next assignment. And I, I received several letters from Dr. Gilberto Trevino, who was chief of veterinary pathology at uh, Fitzsimmons General Hospital in Denver, and the, the idea of of going to Colorado and being close to my family in Oklahoma and so on, uh, had a, you know, had was swaying me in that direction. But also, if you remember the history of uh, tropical canine pancytopenia right. and military working dogs, um, the people that were doing that work back here were was Dr. Paul Hildebrandt and Dr. Dave Huxall and, and many other people. And Dr. Hildebrandt and I had become friends while I was a resident. And we are still today, he's one of the closest friends I have. In fact, Dr. April and Dr. Hildebrandt are my two closest friends. And um, it was a hard decision to whether to come back to Washington, D.C. again. Because I ultimately ended up being here 13 years of my 21 years. but. Walter Reed Army Institute of Research was, wanted, they wanted to start their veterinary pathology preceptorship program, and I enjoy teaching, and I liked the type of research they were doing, so I came back to RARE. And I became, at that time, Dr. Hildebrandt had actually been promoted up to the chief of the division of pathology, which included experimental pathology and veterinary and comparative pathology. So that vacated his old job and I took it and I filled in that position. And we started the preceptorship program. Um, my first resident was Dr. Tony Johnson, who's now on the faculty at LSU. Superb scientist, I mean, scientist and, no, and, pathologist, and pathologist. Really has an eye for detail. Ralph Giles was with me then. And um, then we moved from the Forest Glen Annex to across the street to the main building at Rare. And uh, Ralph Bunty was my third resident. And John Seeley was my fourth. And then we had many others after that. I think 32 altogether. Quite a group that have gone through Rare under the, the residency program. Well, the, con the concept there was a little different. If, if, the, if the resident was given a choice, they could go into a straight residency or they could come to with us at RARE, which took one year longer because they did research while they were learning. And those people that elected to, to come to RARE and do that um, are some of the most prominent people in toxicology today. Louis McKinney, for one. That's right. There's, there's a, an example. Before we leave this period, Milt, do uh, you want to touch on a few oh, yeah, things? Oh, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of things, you know, thinking back like that. In fact, uh, I think Chuck and I were out at the uh, Forest Glen Annex at the, about the same time when we rotated uh, back. Um, th there was an interesting story while we were overseas. I was never uh, in Vietnam per se. I was stationed in Thailand. Uh, when I got there, I asked them where they weren't shooting bullets, and they said Thailand, but I didn't know they were going to put me in northern Thailand where they were shooting bullets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, different Thailand. A different Thailand, yes. Um, one of the problems that we had, I, I, I did some uh, zoonotic uh, disease control when we were teaching some Thai veterinarians and so forth, and, and some of uh, the pathologists uh, would rotate in and out and help us, but a lot of the help that they gave us was the uh, uh, diagnoses of, uh, of different diseases that we uh, were dealing with, and, and of course one of them uh, was rabies, and there seemed to be some kind of subclinical rabies or whatever back then. I don't really remember everything, but I, I remember that we used to send um, the uh, tissues into uh, the lab where uh, Chuck and his colleagues were, and, and I remember one day calling back and, and uh, or they calling me back, I, I, it's 
been years and years ago about you know what what did you do with the animal and and uh, I don't know whether we still had it or it was with the with the um, owners or whatever and and uh, you know they said well that animal has uh, uh, you know rabies or, or it had rabies or at that time it was dead and can you find the the family and and all that and so forth and and my remark was are you sure and the voice on the other phone said um, um, uh, Captain uh, April, this is uh, Colonel So and So. I'm a board certified pathologist, and when I say that animal's got rabies, I, it's got rabies. <laughs> 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 and I always remembered that because I said, "Huh, you know." And and uh, well, well, official pathologist, yeah, it's, it's official, official man. now. And so when uh, one of the funny things was is when <laughs> we were at uh, at uh, back at uh, Forest Glen Annex, I'd ask Chuck about that. I said, "Who was that guy?" <laughs> <laughs> he never really identified himself, but Chuck knew him, and he said, well, he was right. When he said he had rabies, it had rabies. But uh, that was, you know, there's a lot of funny uh, anecdotes about that. And I, and I think, you know, when, when Chuck was uh, back there at Forest Glen and, and so forth is when we had started our, our uh, more or less professional relationship and in getting involved in, in pathology and laboratory animal and, and did a lot of... Um, studying uh, uh, back then and, and uh, had, uh, he would come to our lab animal um, um, training uh, sessions and of course we would go to his and that's when I had the opportunity to sit in on a lot of uh, um, pathology seminars and whatever but of course you know the story is that we coerced him in becoming a, a laboratory animal veterinarian also so I think we got the best of uh, uh, both worlds there, so uh, we one did. Of uh, one of the wisest decisions I ever made was to go for my lab animal board, and very successfully at that too. I think that's a. I think that that you've sort of done the thing that if, that if there are only a few veterinary pathologists have done. I think I was the thirteenth. Okay, you have brought together the, the the two disciplines, if you will, uh, in in uh, and having that perspective. Uh, well, it's it's, you know, and people ask me what my what I am. I, I tell them I'm a comparative pathologist because that's that's really what I am. Uh, comparative pathology is the study of diseases that are common to man and animals, inclusive of those that you can that you can induce a disease in that is close to the human disease, and that's basically what I've been doing the majority of my scientific career. Infectious diseases cancer research, toxicology, and in the last 10 years, genetic diseases, and specifically transgenic science. The Baylor motto is make a mouse a day. Make a mouse a day. And uh, that's where the future is. I hope we get into that. I worked at, uh, I worked with the National, uh, what now is an Institute of Human Genome Research, and uh, they were producing six a week, but they said that theirs was a fairly small scale in comparison to many of the academic institutions in this country. We just, you know, Neighbor just finished a survey that they did for the U.S., you know, involving the USDA um, decision whether it's going to happen or not on whether the Mice and rats come, and birds come under the regula regulations of the AWA. In that survey, I believe they, I believe the figure was 18 million rats and mice. Is what we used in 1998. And if you figure, how many of those were genetically engineered? Uh, we did a, we did a survey, telephone a telephone survey, and we picked. Um, private schools that were medical schools that were heavily involved with transgenic science. Baylor College of Medicine, 95 percent of the mice that we have, which is a daily inventory of over 50,000, are transgenic. My gosh, that's incredible. Um, schools like Stanford, uh, MIT, uh, University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, that figure is above 70 percent. Then we did a private. Then we did a private telephone survey of industry, and called friends of ours in laboratory animal medicine that are directors at the large pharmaceutical companies, and determined that today, last week in fact, 
um, that figures 30% of the mice that they have are genetically engineered. Mm -hmm. So we took an average and said 50, 50%. 50 so that means there's 9 million genetically engineered animals out there. Um, if any company like our new company, Genopath, had got 1% of that, we'd be doing quite well. Sure, sure. Let's let's go back to to the army and uh, and then okay. What influenced your decision to, to to move from the army to the public health service, or am I missing something? Uh, no, I, I think that's a, I think that's a fair question. I me, yeah, it's by all means. <laughs> right. Doc, Dr. April, Dr. Dr. April Horst, 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 yeah, which one of you went into the public health I, service first? Was I, Chuck right? No, I I, oh, uh, you did? I went into the public health service um, first. I'd I'd um, and you, you actually told him it was similar. a good life and to come on over. Come on over. You know, you can drive submarines if you want to. And <laughs> they'll let you do anything you want. You know, uh, I like to say that the public health uh, service is, is uh, a cadre of people that wore uh, military uniforms that never killed anybody intentionally. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, I, I kind of felt fell into the same type of uh, situation that uh, Chuck did a little bit. They were going to. Uh, send me back overseas, uh, I think to Europe, uh, the Army was, to uh, be a food inspector. And I said, I don't think so. And, and uh, yeah. I resigned my commission in the Army, went back to um, you yeah, actually USDA out at uh, Bellsville, where Chuck used to come and help me do large animal um, uh, necropsies. necropsies and so oh. forth and, and mm -hmm. do some diagnosing. I still do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and he helped me when I was uh, working in practice a little bit too, and of course he still does. But the thing there was is is that I realized, and um, uh, both Chuck and I wanted to stay in the area. Public Health Service uh, did offer me that opportunity, and we got into uh, animal modeling, and and uh, uh, felt I think within our careers that if uh, veterinary medicine in its own right is is a tremendous profession, but if we could expand it and uh, potentialize our careers and getting into animal modeling and, and uh, studying diseases that actually affect human uh, uh, um, medicine and so forth, we, we um, felt that that's where that we wanted to go. So I, I went over, had the opportunity to go and uh, started uh, talking to Chuck about it. And of course, I, I wasn't the, I, w I, I would like to say it's probably one of the influencing factors, but the other things that were the opportunity and the jobs and, and the potential that it offered also. So, um, not to be facetious, did I drop my mic? Yeah. To, can you kind of highlight for us some of the, the, the prominent points in your U.S. Public Health Service career? I know you, you were at USIS yeah. and you were, you were at NTP. I had, a, I, had a, I had an unusual career. Um, I, still, I, st I think I still hold the record for going from the rank of 04 to 06 in the shortest period of time. What, w the reason that I switched was because the promotions in the Army really slowed down after the, the Vietnam War. And it, I was a captain a long time, and I finally made major, and it looked like I was going to be a major a long time. Mm -hmm. And it, what, I, I, had a, I had a great love for the Army. Um, and I was very happy at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, but I had been there for about seven years. And I was heavily involved with the research and and I was pretty happy. But I didn't I didn't wasn't making any money. And when you got three kids to think about, you know, you so I was I was uh, moonlighting with Lit and Bionetics, reading slides for, on the National Cancer Institute bioassay program. And I'd been doing that since 1972. And if it had not been for that money coming in to subsidize my rank of major, um, it would have been very difficult up here in the Washington area. Long about that time, an old friend of mine, Dr. Gene New, who was director of uh, comparative medicine for the National Cancer Institute, invited me over for lunch one day and he he said, I want to start a comparative pathology branch. Would you be interested in that position? And I said, as a commission corps officer? And he said, yes. And I said, yes, I would. I went to see Colonel Bob Joy, who was the director mm -hmm. of 
at Rare at the time, and a good friend of mine. And he said, oh, no, Chuck, said, don't, don't switch over to the public health service. He said, stay in the Army. I said, I've asked to go to Panama three times, and, they have, and I haven't got to go yet. I said, and they're going to give me, they're going to promote me to the rank of commander the day I move over there. And he said, well, I can't fight that. And I got out in less than 60 days, 1977. Gene knew, uh, took me under his wing, taught me the, about the NIH system. Uh, of course, Bob Whitney was still there at that time, and mm -hmm. he was a great he, he was a great supporter of my career. We we went back to the old days when he was at Fort Detrick in the Army. Kind of the old buddy system, right? Mel the, the people that you met back in your earliest part of your career in the Army sometimes end up being your closest allies all the way through life. Mm -hmm. So true. And uh, that's definitely true in my situation. Mm -hmm. But um, that was that was a good experience working for the National Cancer Institute. I'd been there one year, and. If you remember, there was a 60-minute special on the National Cancer Institute bioassay program and the fact that they were so far behind in their, their testing of chemicals and that many of the, many of the tests, the in-life part of the studies had already been completed, but there weren't enough pathologists around to read them all. Or they had been read and they had not been reviewed by the government. So, uh, actually, Bob Squire was running that part of the program at that time, and Don Goodman, mm -hmm. and then later Dick Grishmer. And I actually think it was Dick Grishmer that was interviewed by 60 Minutes, and it uh, they didn't they didn't come across very well. Um, 60 Minutes did a pretty thorough job on the interview, and they weren't, they were, in my opinion, they were not very fair and what they took out of all that taping to show on TV. Mm -hmm. But it did put pressure on the National Cancer Institute to, uh, to try to get rid of that backlog. So I get a call one day, and uh, Dr. Gene New got a call from the director of the Cancer Institute saying, don't you have a board certified veterinary pathologist working for you? And he said, yes. And he said, well, there's only two on the NIH campus, you know. He said, uh, we need that guy. <laughs> over, over at the bioassay program, and of course, Gene had a hissy, you know, because I'd only been in that job for a year. Mm -hmm. So we we arbitrated that, and I worked like two days a week in one place and three days a week in the other. And we were the ones that set up the pathology working group, the PWG concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerry Hardesty from EPL, Don Goodman, um, Bob Squire, myself, and a few others. But. That was, an, that was another kind of plateau in my career. I had been reading slides for, from 72 to 77, but when I, became, when I became a Public Health Service Commission Corps officer, that was a direct conflict of interest. I couldn't read slides for them. So I took a tremendous cut in salary when I switched over, but I got promoted in the process and it almost matched. Okay. But because I worked over at the bioassay program, Dr. New wrote me a special efficiency report. He didn't wait until the annual review. He, and so I was promoted to the rank of captain, or 06, mm -hmm. in 13 months from the time I came on active duty. That's, con that's incredible. Yeah. That is incredible. And uh, it's interesting because uh, Milton and I Probably the only two people that you are in, that were captain twice. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> had, we retired <laughs> twice as captains. That's correct. That's correct. A little, bit, little bit difference in pay, though. Yes, a little yeah. bit, a little bit, a little bit different than retired. And then uh, the next thing that happened was um, the Uniformed Services University of the Health Science School of Medicine had started, and uh, in its infancy, they were having a hard time finding enough people to teach. Uh, Dr. Ken Earl from the FIP in neuropathology, who was yes. a wonderful man, um, was the chairman of pathology, and 
and Ken Kinneman, Dr. K Dr. Kinneman, who had who I'd known at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in, in medicinal chemistry, uh, was had a very prominent position with the school. And uh, they coerced me into coming over there to do some teaching first, teach pathology lab to the medical students. And then Dr. Kenneman said, well, why don't you just come over here permanently and head up a new comparative pathology program? So that's what I did. Um, and I set up the clinical pathology lab, the anatomic pathology lab, the, the histology operation, and the electron microscopy suites, and uh, provided diagnostic pathology for Dick Simmons' operation in laboratory animal medicine, mm -hmm. and provided pathology support for the investigators that were doing research there. And I sat on all the scientific review committees for, for grants, and was on a number of other committees that dealt with scientific merit. And meanwhile, I was still at uh, my appointment in pathology there was, was, I was just teaching. And then Dr. Earl decided to come back to the FIP. And uh, the dean made me acting chairman of pathology. Um, I believe at that time there, there were only two veterinary pathologists in the world that were chairman of pathology at a medical school, Bob Leader. Bob Leader, right. And myself. Um, and I became course director, and that was a hundred and, I don't know, what was that? I can't remember how many hours of contact it was, but it was a real high number. And I basically kept the course going and had to come, come up with all the lecture sources. We, we had uh, four full-time people and 65 adjunct faculty, mm. most of which are members of the Martin Forest Institute of mm -hmm. Pathology. And I called upon my old friends that I met when I came here as a resident to become lecturers, and none of them let me down. That's great. The FIP has always mm -hmm. been. Yeah. There's, there's a sidebar to that too. Is you know when when uh, Chuck was over there is is when um, we were in this study group and so forth, and and um, you know they had every slide in the world again. And but um, the um, extension that. Uh, uh, that uh, Chuck probably gave to us as laboratory animal veterinarians that he, he may or may not realize was the fact that he had taught several of us, several of us how to uh, teach and uh, describe things in, in a disease process uh, to other uh, younger pathologists or laboratory animal veterinarians, mostly when we had the seminars that Harry Rose Merrick was running up at Fort Dietrich and so forth. So. In, in essence, um, uh, what he provided was uh, uh, an educational benefit to other people that, that ranged outside of his uh, uh, immediate office or teaching capacity there at the school, and also, I think, gave us the, the confidence and background to go out and, and uh, teach other people. So the ramifications of what Chuck Montgomery has done uh, in that arena of both pathology and laboratory animal medicine has touched on many lives. And that has continued to this day. The series is still going on. Yeah. The weekly seminars in laboratory animal medicine are going on at USIS or the Uniform Services, Services University. The, the other thing too that, you, that that <coughs> School of Medicine provided was a a wonderful uh, place for the Surgeon General to come once a month and have lunch with the veterinarians and the Public Health Service. And Bob Whitney and I put put that together, that is and excellent. it just grew and grew and grew. Um, and uh, in those days, the Surgeon General's office had a very fond place in their heart for for veterinarians. A lot of good goodwill and good science came from those luncheon dates. I'd like to touch a little bit on the pathology working group. I've been involved in a few of these over the years when I work with the Food and Drug Administration and otherwise. Those things, you folks actually develop those things. I think right. they're excellent. I think even today the, um, the Registry of Toxicologic Pathology for Animal hosts, hosts uh, working groups to standardize the nomenclature right. of lesions in animals and and it's it's a collective sort of thing it's not a heavy-handed one person 
no, sort I'm, of thing I'm as on, it has been I'm on in the some past. of those nomenclature committees as it as it involves the P53 knockout mouse. Um, the the PWG was really the first good example of a peer review. That's that's the catchword in the pharmaceutical industry and in the in contract talks field is peer review of data. It was it was developed by the government for the primary purpose of validating the pathologist interpretation on a two-year bioassay project, which is a chronic tox mm -hmm. environment. It involved both tumor and non-tumor pathology. And It, it al it's always amazed me, well, you know, it, when, I was, when I went to the National Toxicology Program, of course, that's where the PWG was moved to. It was in IEHS, mm -hmm. North Carolina. So I sat on, uh, I've lost track how many, probably over 100 um, PWGs in chronic. But I was, my, my position at, at actually with the National Toxicology Program was to set up the PWG concept for 90-day studies. Very okay. quick studies. Yeah, and that target, or so, but, yeah, target organ. It's all target organ pathology, which yeah. is, which is, uh, it worked just as well for non-tumor pathology as it did for tumor pathology. Well, it certainly has helped the profession in in, in just standardizing the nomenclature of proliferative lesions in mm -hmm. in. Uh, in well, the other, the other, I think another thing too that helped that, it was one, it was probably one of the worst assignments I ever had, but, I. I still benefit from it still today. The National Toxicology Program had attempted to come up with a standard nomenclature system using a system that was first developed at the NCTR in Jefferson, Arkansas by Charlie Frith. And that program kind of lost funding and interest and, and it kind of died. So when I first came to the National Toxicology Program in 1981, Jean, Dr. McConnell, who was my boss then, and my fishing buddy, um, dropped that on me as a project, the Toxicology Data Management System, TDMS. And he said, get this thing working again, be the liaison between the, the NCTR and the National Toxicology Program, get the, the hardware and the software working. We want a touch screen for the pathologist the to Beckman, use. Beckman. Which back then, considering the hardware that was available, was um, almost an impossible task. But, but to finish the nomenclature part, five years later, we finished. Dr. Gary Dill was on that committee. Dr. Tom Bucci was on that committee and myself. And um, some pathologists out in, at the Oregon Regional Primate Center, and we developed a a basic terminology system that did not have the word itis or osis in it. So if it was hepatitis, it was inflammation, chronic, focal, mild, periportal, liver. That system works so well that you can implement it in diagnostic labs and academia. And I've tried it in all three of them, and it works great. That was later picked up by the American College of Veterinary Pathologists and funded. Then it was turned over to the American Veterinary Medical Association with the understanding that they'd have a full-time person to, to uh, integrate that into the um, Snow med? Snow, it's snow vet, right. Snow vet. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, one of the, I, I think one of the most um, gratifying things that's ever happened in my career is that TDMS system, which was a pain to work on, was finally picked up by the World Health, World Health Organization. And for the first time in history, we've got people in France and in Germany and England using the same verbiage that we use in the United States. And it's, I go to national meetings now and, and see 
data presented that way, and it, it really makes my heart feel good. The TDMS is the Toxicology Data Management System. I used it at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We used it out there. Yeah. I was going to ask both you and Milt to so, sort of give me a sense of the, uh, the um, environment in your early public health service days in terms of uh, the opportunities that you had or that you saw. It's almost unlimited. Mm -hmm. uh, the PHS functions completely different than the DOD about assignments. And basically any job that's in the public health service can be a commissioned officer position. It can be a civilian position or a commissioned corps position. The, the onus is on the, whoever's director of the lab to take that position and make it one or the other. So it's really one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. uh, a veterinarian can literally go over and, and if he's got a close friend at NIH and say, you know, I'd like to work in your laboratory. And that can be done. Oh. And, uh, you know, Melts had so many different jobs in the public health service. That it's because he can't keep a job. <laughs> Is that what? Yeah. <laughs> I keep firing me out. <laughs> well, I, you know, to he, he, see. His, biggest, his biggest problem, though, was switching from cows to monkeys. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, he, you know, Chuck kept telling me, you know, medicine is medicine. It doesn't That's matter true. whether it's a cow, a monkey, or a mouse, or whatever. But I was like him, too, you know. I always thought uh, mice were baby rats, you know, when I first started in uh, <laughs> <laughs> laboratory animal medicine, but, um, you know, as you get older, you, 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 you don't, uh, well, I, I, you know, you just don't have uh, the strength where you realize that, you know, uh, what I was doing in large animal medicine primarily out at Agriculture Research Center, it takes, uh, it takes uh, uh, strength and, and a lot of time and, and so forth, and, and uh, it's, it's, you know, you, you realize a lot of things as you get older, you know. Now I realize I want to be warmer. The older I get, the warmer <laughs> I want to be. Yeah, me too. But um, I think uh, touching on what you had said is the fact that there was uh, a lot of combination of things that uh, this area uh, is just a, a tremendous um, uh, area for uh, biomedical research, and that's because NIH is here, Walter Reed's here, the FDA's here. Uh, you know, the pharmaceutical companies that uh, operate in and around uh, the corridor um, uh, gives a tremendous uh, value to that uh, biomedical arena. And I think that um, uh, public health service at the particular time that we rotated out of the Army um, saw that and, and the shift was uh, from uh, a nation that had just been uh, committed a lot of resources. Uh, you know, in a, uh, a conflict to, to now adjust those resources and put them back into that particular arena. And, and uh, a, a lot of good people did stay in the Army and, and um, still are. Um, we had the opportunity, I think, to stay in the area because of our families and so forth and, and, and shift there and get that continued education. And, and uh, it provided a uh, an avenue and a, and a conduit to do that, and and I never mm -hmm. I had I don't have any regrets because like I say Chuck and I at times had talked about going back into a private practice because it was uh, a a good area uh, to mm -hmm. do that. But I think I think to give credit where credit's due though, um, I think that probably Dr. April and I both were allowed opportunities partially because of Dr. Joe Held, mm -hmm. and later when he stepped down from his position, Dr. Robert Whitney. Mm -hmm. um, they were un unbelievably strong leaders and very well respected in, by both physicians and s veterinarians and PhD scientists. And they kind of laid a framework for young officers to come in and assume fairly high levels of leadership in, the, in multiple agencies. Mm -hmm. Responsibility mm -hmm. and offered collegiality. Right. And I, I, I kind of liked it in those days because I could wear my uniform. Mm -hmm. when, I moved, when I moved to the National Toxicology Program, uh, they didn't have a policy about wearing uniforms there. So when the Surgeon General Coop came out mm -hmm. with this directive about it would be nice if you did one day a week, I did. 
I already had my uniform, so. But I, I, I think I was the only PHS officers at the NIEHS that wore his uniform on a regular basis. Both of you came into the, well, actually the lab animal field and, and into the public health service, uh, not, af not right after the Animal Welfare Act had been enacted, but when it was really being put into to, to place. I mean, it was really being tested for its first time. I know we had the, there was a ban on exporting uh, rhesus monkeys out of India at mm -hmm. one time. And mm -hmm. Can you kind of just didn't slow it, did, it didn't slow us down much. We, uh, in fact, I learned a lot from that, that exercise. When, when we couldn't get rhesus monkeys, we switched to cyanomologous monkeys out of Malaysia because we had, the Army had a lab in Kuala Lumpur. Lumpur? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, what I learned real quick is when you're doing infectious disease research with trypanosomiasis, babesiosis, uh, malaria, schistosomiasis, that there's a big difference in host response between a rhesus monkey and a cyanomologous monkey. Mm -hmm. A macaque is not a macaque, you know? It's like saying that all my strains are the same or all rat strains, that's it's not true. Mm -hmm. And if anything, the cyanomologous monkey in many ways was a better model because they, that whatever host response you got in the rhesus, you could just double or triple it in the cyano, with, especially with trypanosomiasis. But your, I think your question was kind of directed more towards the regulatory issue. Um, I, I have never ever feared or worried about any regulation the United States government has to, and, and it's a reflection to animals. There are some that we don't want that, and, and we fight against them and we, and we succeed so far. But the ones that are intact and that rule our life as uh, both investigators and as scientific managers are okay as far as I'm concerned. They, they, they make sure that the quality of animal care as it relates to biomedical research is not just adequate, but excellent. And uh, I was asked by a venture capitalist about a month ago whether if they added rats or mice under the Animal Welfare Act, would, would it have a negative influence on starting a new business? And I said, absolutely not. I said, most people that are already doing, already it. doing mm -hmm. it. That's right. At Baylor College of Medicine, we use 23 different species of animals. 98% are rodents. But we account for every animal that's used in the same way a dog or a, or a sheep or a pig is. And uh, those animals get really superb care. When a transgenic mouse is worth $500 or a transgenic rabbit's worth $50,000, and I mean that literally, insured through Lloyd's of London for that, you, uh, you do cesarean sections on mice and take care of mothers. And if anything, it's improved the quality of science and the, and the, and the quality of uh, humane animal care. So I, I'm, I don't have any concerns about that, really. Both you and Milt have been very active in the American Association of Laboratory Animal Science and, and ACLAM as well, the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine. Would you like to touch on that a little bit? Well, I think we're all victims of our upbringing, as Jim Rogers used to tell me when I was a resident. He, Jim Rogers and I were good friends, and he was from Florida. And he's the fellow that had the boat. Right? Yeah, he's the guy who had the boat. I tell you, I oh, caught, a lot, blue, caught, yeah, caught yeah. a lot of caught a lot of bluefish with yeah. him. Uh, I miss Air him. Force, I, I miss Jim. Um, but Jim Jim used to make that comment. He said, you know, when when you're in residency, there's a point where you you start getting a little cocky, you know. And Jim used to say, that, nah, be careful." My grandpa, well, he used to say, never try to rise above your upbringing. And uh, I've remembered that from time to time in my career. But uh, a lot of truth in that. Do you have any uh, melt? Is there any uh, 
thing that stands out in your oh, I, dealings I, with, with Chuck? Sure. I, I think, um, you know, back to your, your uh, question there is that I think uh, in terms of um, ALAS or ACLAM, uh, you naturally get involved in, in things that you, you feel um, uh, good about and that you have uh, uh, some um, uh, collegiality and in, in, uh, committee work and in, in doing things and always have, uh, um, I've felt, and I think Chuck has, um, uh, certainly has uh, giving back you know, to the profession and, and working through these organizations that are national organizations that represent um, animal science and, and uh, biomedical research at the highest levels and, and uh, bring about those things that you had said that the Animal Welfare Act uh, certainly gives us the impetus and the, the laws and the regulation. Uh, however, I think these organizations uh, rise even above that and provide uh, mm -hmm. standards of, uh, of compliance and, and um, um, self-regulation that uh, is, has been a tremendous boon to um, animal research and animal care mm -hmm. in this country. And, and I agree with, with Chuck. And I, I think as veterinarians, uh, basically, uh, you know, the commitment is uh, the care of the animal, uh, uh, the factors there that involve uh, their their surroundings and and uh, how they're maintained and and kept. Uh, and I think that as as you work on up through the levels and become uh, administrators and and uh, directors and so forth, um, you really never kind of lose that uh, sight or insight and and uh, working with and through national organizations uh, uh, such as uh, that um, uh, provide you with the uh, ability to always maintain that attitude. ALAS is a very special organization to me. It's the only organization that I belong to that every aspect of animal science is involved from the investigator who uses the animal to the animal caretaker that takes care of the room that the animal's in, to the veterinary technologist who bleeds the animal and does radiographs on the animals, to the veterinarian that takes care of the health and well-being of those animals, to senior administrators in animal care operations that may be accountants uh, or, or senior managers, people with mm -hmm. master's degrees in business administration, to the vendors that provide feed and caging and, and equipment for these animals. Name me one or other organization that has that breadth. That's why the meetings are so much fun, because when you go to the meetings, you, you meet people from all walks of animal care. And some of my closest friends are animal care takers, you know, people who uh, really, really love animals. And they reflect that in the quality work that they do. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, that goes back a long ways for both of us. All of us were animal caretakers at one time. That's right. That's true. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, but, uh, and I remember uh, Chuck uh, and I agreeing on, on one premise that, you know, uh, at, at times in your life you oversee any number of, of laboratory animal caretakers or technicians, but we agreed on one premise that we never asked our people to do anything that we couldn't that do or wouldn't want to do. Right. That's right. And, an and I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of regard that you get from your, your caretaking staff and so forth that realize that you can go in there right. and work with those animals or clean that cage or not afraid to pick up a, a hose, uh, uh, you know, in the middle and of the day dirty. if you're running short, you know. And, and get dirty. And, and so... Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, when I was a young first lieutenant in the Army, um, we had an, an outbreak of Asian flu in the, in the, in the animal care staff. And um, I think I had 70 employees at the time, and about a third of them were homesick. And I had all these animals to take care of. So what, uh, what I did was I went home, put on my fatigues and my combat boots, and came back to work and went into the, the mouse rooms and started ch changing cages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did it because there's only so many hands there, and they needed more hands. And, and I was you're not above it. 
I was raised in the construction business. My dad is an electrician, and, and I worked as an electrician's helper several times while I was going through college. And uh, I've worked hard my whole life. I've, I've been making money for myself since I was nine. And I've been working since I was nine. So it, hard work and sweat don't bother me a bit, you know. I've, I've been RCA rodeo contestant person. Is that right? Yes. That's a little known fact. That's Charlie. a little known fact that I've uh, rodeoed for four years. You rodeoed for four years. Yeah. And I've worked on ranches and farms and, and worked in the wheat, wheat industry, you know, driving a combine. And when I was in veterinary school, I had held down as many as four, four jobs, cleaning a lot of manure. Yeah. I even sold used cars once. I don't think Did I ever sold I, I think he sold me once. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably still have it. <laughs> it's still running, huh? <laughs> but um, you, you would not believe the impact that had when I w went to work in, that, in the animal rooms for a week. On on the on other the, on the morale of on the morale of the animal care staff. Oh yes, without a doubt, I'm sure they were. And uh, there were times when I would give little lessons on how to recognize if an animal's sick mm -hmm. while I was doing that. And right after that, I had a lot of animals coming into the necropsy room because I would listen to these people. If they said, "Doc, he's sick," I said, "Well, how do you know he's sick?" And he said, "Well, he's sitting over there in the corner of the cage by himself." They're the first line of defense, the caretakers. That's right. And I think every, every manager has to recognize that. We had an outbreak mm -hmm. of Carinobacterium cuturi at Pine Bluff Arsenal. And that, that could have been a terrible, terrible incident, but it was detected very early. And that's what saved it. We, still, end, we still end up killing about 3,000 animals. The one you always include in your list of differentials for liver necrosis. That's, that's true. Right. Because I've sure seen a lot of them. Yeah, because it, it's epidemic once again. We're all a victim of our upbringing. That's true. That's true. Well, that's, that's an interesting period. I want to, in the next hour, what I'd like to do is move on past the U.S. Public Health Service and okay. go, into, go into more of the, uh, your academic appointments. Is there any particular A-last meeting you remember that, uh, that, uh, that you and Chuck were at that was, seems most prominent in your mind? I don't know. We've had no. so many. Yeah. Um, you just uh, don't remember. I think well, I've no, only, we, I think we I've remember only a lot of things. Years. A lot of things we can't tell you here oh, because uh, <laughs> it's not going to be very appropriate. We can't but, do uh, this. you know, there's uh, um, things that, um, there's one thing that uh, I'd like to say that you know, when we took the ACLAM board, I think it was at a AVMA meeting or Mm -hmm. Or yeah, you know, that's where they where they gave them back then. It was in St. Louis, and and uh, uh, Chuck and I and several other fellows in our study group had decided to go out early um, to um, to study and kind of relax, and mm -hmm. because you know you're uptight and you've you've done a lot, and this is this is the you know uh, uh, the real test, and and uh, you got to be able to pass it. And uh, you know, quite frankly, there was some pressure on all of us to do this because uh, of the capacity that we were functioning in at the time. Um, but uh, as the, as the story goes, um, one of the last things that Chuck had said, he you know he brought out some some articles, and he always had these articles with him, you mm -hmm. know. And one of them was real recent, like the the A Last Journal had just come out the week before. And I said, Ah, Chuck, I said, any going to put anything on a test. I said, things only come out a week before. He said, you watch. So I said, well, I better thumb through that, you know, and just because, I, you know, he got my attention, I thumbed through that thing, and by darn if they didn't put on uh, PPC toxicity, and they put the same pictures Is that, that were right, in that the, article. From that article, and, and on uh, toes. kept us on our toes, you know, and, and after the test, of course, you know, I said, uh, you know, you're right. <laughs> so that's just a, an that's anecdote great. that I uh, wanted to share. It's common sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, we get, we're going to break now, and uh, we're not on camera anymore. But we're Welcome back to the Charles Lewis Davis Foundation's interviews and in legends in veterinary pathology. I'm with Chuck Montgomery, and we've gone over a lot of his early career, his veterinary career, his uh, career in the Army, his career in the Public Health Service, and uh, 
there's a, the next phase of, of your career, Chuck, is, is out there in the world, outside of the public health service and, and, and the Army. Can you tell us a little bit about your move to Tennessee right after the public health service? Yeah, that was an interesting part of my life, I guess. I'd been in the military or the uniformed services for 21 years and never had to go out and look for a job, you know? And uh, you find out how much your people care about you when you, when you finally get ready to retire and, and uh, you're looking for a job. Um, I had a lot of job opportunities. Of course, I remember Alex Tapoli telling me one time that I asked him why he bought a house in the middle of New Jersey when, when he went up there and he said, well, because there's over 52 companies that could use a veterinary pathologist and they're all within driving range of the middle of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I, I, uh, I, since I lived on the East Coast for 13 years of my uniform service career, I really didn't want to come back to this part of the United States. Um, I didn't really want to go to the West Coast because of the high cost of living. So, you know, I just immediately erased two thirds of the job market. Mm -hmm. So, but I was looking for a position in uh, the middle of the United States someplace. Um, a company called Biotherapeutics had, was just being formed. It, they, their primary mission was cancer research with uh, immune mediating products and since the last five Montgomery men have died of cancer I have a strong interest in cancer research and did that at the National Toxicology Program and so on but um, be, because I had boards in laboratory animal medicine and pathology I could wear two hats for them mm -hmm. and save them some money certainly so uh, they paid me pretty well to go to Franklin, Tennessee. They, they were building the laboratory at that time. And it was a wonderful experience. Um, I learned a lot about uh, human tumor transplants into nude mice and cell line work and a lot of in vitro studies and as it relates to pathology, cy cytology. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were opening laboratories r rather fast and throughout the United States and every one of those labs needed nude mouse capabilities so I met a lot of people in the industry that were dealing with colonies of nude mice. I got I think I knew, knew most of the nude mice breeders in, in the United States at that time. Um, we pr I also was head of the comparative pathology lab there so I was doing the diagnostic work and providing the research su support for the investigators that were doing developing uh, immunomodulating drugs. Bought a 34 acre farm there mm -hmm. in Chapel Hill, Tennessee. And really enjoyed living there. And uh, then the company went bankrupt. They uh, went to about 37 million dollars in two years and, mm. and uh, there I was looking for a job. I was had just turned 50, and uh, that's that's a wake-up call when you're, you're 50 years old looking for a job. But I was very fortunate. I put my CV out on the street and did dealt with some headhunters, and and ultimately though, the best job offers I had were word of mouth from friends. And it boiled down to uh, two jobs. The directorship of the what was then called the Baylor Animal Program in Houston at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and a similar job at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine and I had the good fortune of negotiating with the two schools at the same time mm -hmm. and they, I got into a bidding war and I was in the middle so it turned out to be a wonderful thing for, for me I ultimately chose Baylor College of Medicine for a couple of reasons. Um, their benefit package, package was around 43 percent, mm. and uh, attractive. And the salary, the salary was quite good. And the other 
was a, I have an autoimmune disease that part of the manifestation of it is a Renaud's phenomena, and I don't do well in cold weather. So Houston is, mm -hmm. has very little cold weather. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's quite hot. But that's, that's, that's the reason I took the job at Baylor. Well, I'm sure you were, a f you know, you were viewed upon as a formidable authority, both in the lab animal medicine field and in the pathology field, which make you very desirable to any. Uh, but I think it's also your love of teaching and, and what that led you back to academia, didn't it not? It yes, it did. And research as well. I, I, I was kind of, had an unusual career in the uniform services in that I held academic appointments at medical schools and veterinary schools while I was on active duty. And you still hold appointments to this day. You're a full professor at Baylor, Oklahoma State, and Texas A&M, if, right. if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Um, my, my old alum at Oklahoma State honored me with a, the most recent appointment I have, and that was in January of this year. Congratulations. The, um, well, you certainly you certainly have over the years in the Pola, Pola and both C. L. Davis, gross morbid pathology courses, and others that C. L. Davis has hosted, and the AFIP as well. You've always been an invited speaker. You've always been a, the highlight of a program. People come to listen to Chuck Montgomery, and and also I think it's also the gospel according to Chuck too that we listen to. <laughs> And that gospel is com one of comparative medicine. Yes, it is. That's my true love. There's only one species when it comes to pathology, I think. Liver's a liver. And the host response to injury is the way, the best way to learn pathology. Then if you, if you really get that down and understand it, then all you have to learn is the differences between the species on host response for that particular organ. And it's a lot easier to remember the differences than it is to try to remember all of everything for every species. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a common sense approach. Uh, I learned that from Alex DiPoli, who, who basically said that the liver can only respond so many ways to injury, and that's the way he taught. And uh, I. I I'm grateful to this day that I had that opportunity to, to work with him. He was a great teacher. However, his, the cubicle here at AFIP had less swarts in it. Alex Tipoli and myself and Shelly Diamond. So if no two people could get up and go to the bathroom at the same time, you had to do it by the numbers because the, the backs of the chairs were so close. Yeah. and. Uh, It was, it was wonderful in those days. At Baylor, you were director of the Center for Comparative Medicine and, and then right. later the, uh, the head of the uh, veterinary pathology branch. The, at, yeah, the Comparative Pathology branch. Tell us a little bit about the Center for sure. Comparative Medicine. Please. Sure. Ba Baylor's had a long distinguished history in medical research that dates clear back to Dr. DeBakey coming there. Oh, yes. Right. And, the and starting, starting the cardiovascular program. And he, he's still alive and kicking and active. He's a wonderful man. Uh, and, he, and to be honest with you, that had a lot to do with me taking that job. I wanted the opportunity to work with Dr. DeBakey. And uh, that program that deals with extracorporeal pumps or left ventricular assist device pumps um, is a collaboration with the Japanese government and, uh, and grant support. And it, that all that's work, it, all that work is done in calves, 500 pound calves. Is that right? Yeah. So I, people tease me about being a mouse pathologist, but um, I, I work, I still work with cattle, and um, still work with pigs. I don't, I don't care what kind of animal it is. I just enjoy pathology. But the, I changed the name from the Baylor Animal Program because it had the word animal in it and I wanted less visibility. Yes. And also I wanted the word comparative in it. So that's the first thing I did when I got there was I, I had to get faculty approval to change the name to the Center for Comparative Medicine. It, uh, I restructured it 
so that there was a research component, an academic component, an animal, a veterinary clinical care and surgery component, and the animal care part. We had four, four branches. Mm -hmm. I wanted, uh, I got additional slots for veterinarians when I came there, so we had seven veterinarians. We went from two to seven, and, uh, and that provided enough care that the people that were doing large animal work could have a veterinarian, the people that had primates could have a veterinarian, and of course the majority of them people were using rodents, so we needed a lot of care there. Mm -hmm. But it, um, Baylor had gone through some bad years, and they had c made a firm decision to change that image and to, they did not have a letter of assurance at that time from the National Institute of Health. They, they were not AAA lack accredited. They, they had some major problems with uh, facilities that needed to be corrected. So uh, it was a big task. Um, but I, I, set a go, I set a time limit and I told them I could get them AAA lack accredited in five years and we did it in four years and three right. months. I got the letter of assurance in 60 days just by getting on a plane and coming up here to NIH and finding the people that were causing the problem. And it was, it was just as much Baylor's fault as it was anybody else's. But, but um, I just basically told NIH, what, what, what's it going to take to get this? And I'll do it. So we got it in 60 days. I still have a letter in my file from Dr. Bobby Alford, vice president of the school. Uh, applauding that effort to get that, to get that letter of assurance. Now it's become the norm in, mm -hmm. in, in just about any That's right. institution that wants to do Well, it's, I'm, I think, you know, it has a tremendous impact on your grantsmanship capabilities. But um, we went from, you know, 40 employees to 93 because of the growth in the transgenic field. And we went from Five, five viruses in a room when I got there to half a virus. We've got, we've got, still have some rooms that have Tyler's GD7 in them. Okay. I was going to say our orphan parvovirus right. is the other insidious one. That That's right. That we and uh, it, but basically I did that with, by just changing the caging system to micro-isolator cages. And so how long has it been now that you've been at, at Baylor School? I've been there 10 years. College of Medicine. Been there 10, 10 years. years. A lot of this gray hair. Is that right? No. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well, that's been it. That you've had a really illustrious career, a very distinguished career. I'd like to. I'd like to ask you a little bit about careers. Your your thoughts on on uh, and and also I understand you you've got your own company now as well. Maybe you could explain that a little bit. But after that, if you could just talk a little bit about careers in veterinary pathology. A, and, and or okay. comparative pathology. Well, comparative pathology is uh, is a unique discipline. It uh, I've found over the years recruiting veterinarians that are interested in laboratory animal medicine and uh, veterinary pathologists that it's it's pretty difficult to to talk a veterinary pathologist in, into coming to a medical school to work. You either have to like it or you don't. Um, somebody with very good credentials, with uh, six to eight years of experience, would tell me over the telephone, um, well, you know, I've only been work, I've, I've always worked with pig, pig diseases. Can I still do that if I come to Baylor? And I said, well, you may or you may not. We, we do use pigs. But I said, uh, the emphasis here is in genetic diseases and molecular disease. So. If you can uh, justify doing that work in pigs, so be it. But you need to be able to adapt to the animal population that we have to work on, and they, they wouldn't they wouldn't come to Baylor. I have been fortunate in in hiring some very good people that that they went, have gone on and to do big, bigger and better things. My, my philosophy has always been that, that, that there's really only one medicine. 
and that if you understand the diseases of the human and the pathology of diseases of the human, then because you're a veterinarian and have that strong background in animal disease as, as far as epidemiology, preventive medicine, microbiology, and pathophysiology, then it's very easy to try to, to come up with an animal model for a human disease. But if you're missing one or the other of that, it, it puts you in a very bad position. So the best comparative medicine or comparative pathology programs that have developed over the years have either been by the government <coughs> mm -hmm. or places like Johns Hopkins, University of Alabama, Birmingham, uh, Russell Lindsay. Russ, you know, Russell mm -hmm. Lindsay's, uh, the first one was at Bowman Gray, you know, that program. And, and that was Tom uh, Clark's. Tom Clark's, and, and uh, of course, that's really heavily oriented towards primates. Um, University of Washington, Seattle. Um, there, are, there are lots of, you know, several good programs, but if you stop and think about it, a lot of those programs are medical schools. Do you see that as a trend? John? Yes, yes, I do. You do? In, in every medical school, it will be a comparative medicine or comparative uh, yes. pathophysiology? Yes, the, the trend's already going that way. And, and, and how does that, in, in your view, for a young aspiring veterinary student, uh, someone who's, you know, thinking maybe about going from practice to back to, to school, or, yeah. or for someone who's already has their mind set on pathology, Slash and also, if I might interject, your your thoughts on the, the the duality, if you will, of the lab animal and the pathology in terms okay. of of how well, that I, utility. The, and, and in order to succeed um, in comparative medicine, you have to have a good understanding of the application of animal models to the human. But the the mindset of being able to marry up the clinical part and the pathology part, some people can't handle that. Some people want to be one or the other, but they don't want to do both. To look at the pathology in a vacuum from, right. from clinical That's science, true. They, yeah. they give me the slide and I'll make the diagnosis, rather than talk to the investigator or to the clinician about the case prior to the necropsy. I mean, that, I learned that from Roger Pantier when I was a veterinary student. You, you have to talk to the farmer. Oh, yes. And, 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 and it's not any different today working in with molecular biologists. You have to talk to the maker of the transgenic mouse if you expect to provide that investigator with an outstanding pathology service. And that's basically what we've done at Baylor in the 10 years. I've, I've developed a program that is very detailed as to the relationship between the investigator who made the mouse and the pathology or laboratory that's providing them support. The first thing I do with an investigator is when they make an appointment to see me is to do a literature search on that person prior to actually having the meeting so that I know exactly what they published where they published it. Um, you, can, you can tell if you follow a person's career back far enough on, by their publications where they've been, what mm -hmm. institutions they've been Certainly. in, who, who their boss was, you know, what departments they were in, things like that. You can learn a lot about the individual just doing a literature search. But it also, um, when you've had that first meeting, um, provides you the opportunity to say, I read your article in Science last year and I, I really found it to be an interesting model. And uh, oh, by the way, I, yeah, I noticed that you used to be at University of Michigan. Do you know Dr. So and So? Mm -hmm. Who's my friend? You know, and uh, it kind of breaks down the barrier of dis and during the discussion process. And it, everybody wants to be loved a little bit. Certainly. So when you do when you do it that way, um, it sets up the right type of feeling that when you start the conversation. I always start ha have the meeting 
in what I call my optics room. It's a, it's a room that is off to the side of the, la of the lab that has all my morph morphometric analysis equipment, my gross photography equipment, my uh, all of my good mic quality microscopes of various types are on one wall. And then we have a seven-headed microscope in the middle of the room with a blackboard on the other side. And many times when they come to see me the first time, they've already had some s slides made. Yes. And uh, they don't know how to interpret them. And sometimes the slides were made by graduate students and they're 12 microns thick. So it gives me an opportunity to show them our slides that are four microns thick and just go back and forth between their slide and my slide. And that, you've, got, you've got them right there mm -hmm. once they see your slide. But it also gives them an opportunity to say, gee, this laboratory is well equipped and they, uh, they obviously know what they're doing or they wouldn't have this kind of equipment. And it kind of gets them on your turf and again, breaks down many barriers. We spend a lot of time talking about the gene, the gene protein, the genomics part, the goals of their laboratory. Do they, are they working on one gene or are they working on a family of genes? Mm -hmm. Is the reason that they're doing what they're doing based on an anatomic system, a mechanism? You know, what's, what's driving the decision for them to make a mouse for muscular dystrophy versus influenza virus infections? And, and who, who's in that laboratory? Is there expertise in ultrastructure? Is there, is there, are there people there that have had a lot of experience with, with say, viral diseases? Or, it gives me a good feel for how solid their lab is and cuts, cuts out a lot of duplication of effort because you can, when you set up a collaborative agreement with an investigator, you really should avoid redundancy. Loss of time is loss of money, really. And then based on that, that first discussion, then I sit down and write a, my own protocol to do the pathology support for that project. And I'll go back to the literature and, and study and pull up all the information I can on that gene and try to anticipate what the target organ's going to be. Sometimes, I'd say half the time, you, pro you, can, you can get a pretty good idea of what organ system is involved. But it's in, in many cases, it's not one organ system. It's multiple organ systems. So then based on that, that we, I write a, a draft protocol. I send it to the investigator, and they, they make their changes and additions. A lot of times, they'll call back and say, we just did another experiment yesterday, and now we have this data. So it's up-to-date information. We, we rewrite the protocol to fit that. And then we set up the necropsies and, and, every, and the drawing of blood for clinical chemistry and hematology. And if imaging is necessary, we do the imaging and so on. But it's, it's a collegial effort between the pathologist and the investigator. I've talked to many veterinary pathologists that have attempted to do transgenic pathology and that, that don't like it because there's no intellectual collaboration. My feeling is that to succeed in this field, you must have intellectual collaboration between the pathologist and the user. If you build up a strong alliance between your laboratory and that investigator or his laboratory, that alliance goes on to other institutions that many people will leave, graduate students will leave, and they'll go start their career at another place, and they'll come back and use you for their pathology support even though they're in a different university. And you've now gained the, the expertise to look at these animals' tissues, and, and oftentimes it's something that's missing and not, not present, and the obvious is over, that's overlooked that's true. oftentimes. That's you, true. You've taken this co approach also, uh, uh, looking at transgenic and knockout animals, and this collegiality, these discussions, these reports, and what have you, to a commercial enterprise now. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it, you, I, sometimes your career runs in a circle. 
I told you earlier that when I went to Pine Bluff Arsenal, I replaced Steve Pakes. Mm -hmm. Steve Pakes called me last October and he said, are you still doing a lot of transgenic mouse pathology? I said, yes. But I said, I'm work only working two days a week now because I'm semi-retired. And I have another company called Compath, which does toxicology support work. Mm -hmm. And I have a handful of clients for that. So, but I, just as long as it doesn't interfere with my bass fishing. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Bass fishing but, number one. That's right. Well, you got to get everything in right. When you become priorities. 60 years old, you change your priorities. Certainly. Just a bit, you know? You're allowed to. Yeah. So, um, Steve said, would you consider doing this for money? And said he had a couple of people that were interested in forming a company. One of those people was Dr. Errol Friedberg, who's the chairman of pathology at University of Texas Southwestern. And um, Errol has over 400 publications in the field of molecular biology and transgenic science. Um, we have one, one of our partners is a, an attorney who has been very successful in investing in biomedical related companies. Mm -hmm. And one of our partners is a retired banker that's running a, a financial support business out of his home. And uh, it's, uh, it's been interesting put, in putting this company together. And uh, we, we hope to be in our new laboratory in November of this year. But in, or it'll be in Conroe, Texas. Conroe, Texas. But it's basically doing, it's, it's taking what I've learned at Baylor and, and, and switching it over to a commercial enterprise. And a need thereof, too. A tremendous oh, need tremendous for the need. characterization of transgenic and, and a tremendous animals. Need. And, and now selected, deleted knockouts, as I'm reading. And, that's and, right. And partial and transgenes and that's partial right. knockouts. That's There's true. And, a and, and, language. And, and the use of congenic strains. Mm -hmm. strains. And, and taking the initial knockout or transgenic mouse and then changing the, st the whole story by breeding them back on another inbred strain. If it was made in a C57 black and you back cross to the 129 SV or you back cross to the FBB, the, the whole pathology changes sometimes. Incredible. Yeah. The P53 knockout mouse is so a good, one has good example. To know their strain and, 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 and background strain. Well, that's where my business. background laboratory on medicine has come in. And uh, of course, I, to be honest with you, when I, when I was doing rodent pathology before I got my boards in lab animal medicine, that was a given. You had to know strain differences. There's so many strains, though, now. It's I know. Well, they, and, uh, so many some, of, some of my colleagues are, have been very adamant about the fact that sprig dolly rats aren't all alike. That, yes. that, the, vend that, over that, the, that the vendor sources are different. And I, that's why the government uses the Fisher 344 rat, and that's why they use the B6C3 F1 mouse, because the, using an F1, you've always got, you know, a continuum that you don't have genetic drift. Genetic drift is a big problem in transgenic science. Um, the 129 SB mouse is a problem. There is genetic drift. And uh, there's been some problem with duplication of the same experiment over time because of genetic drift. So all of these are very important issues. Now, how does that, what's that have to do with young veterinarians coming into the field? It's, it's not the same world out there today. I, I turned down the opportunity to go back and get a PhD when the Army offered me the opportunity to do so because I was with one of the best guys in the world, Paul Hildebrandt, at the time, and he didn't have a PhD, and he was a good scientist, and we were working with some of the best people in the world as far as infectious disease research, and Walter Reed's laboratory was just state of the art. And I, I just couldn't justify that in my mind. That, and I elected to go back and get double boards in, in, in place of the PhD. If I had that all to do over again, I'd still get the double boards, especially in those two fields. But I would get the PhD because everything today is molecular. 
And if a veterinary pathologist is going to provide com a com work in a comparative pathology environment, especially, does not have a good understanding of DNA chemistry, in genetics, and molecular tools, and, and really understand why a southern blot works, uh, they're 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 hurt. They're hurting. They're behind the. They're they're, they're behind. So you, uh, a good a good pathologist today that works in a comparative medicine environment needs needs to have that background, and a PhD is just one way to get that. I would agree. I mean, with you that. can take you can take a lot of short courses and and, and learn a lot, but um, it, it's important that they that they they have that kind of a, a training. Uh, most most of the large pharmaceutical companies are looking for those kind of people today. So. And, and the marriage, the marriage between molecular medicine and, and cell biology and what's going on in the drug development field today is a strong marriage. Some of the best work in cell biology is coming out of, the, of industry today. And companies like uh, Pfizer, of course, helps when you invent a drug called Viagra. Certainly. But they, they've had a lot of money to invest back into their R&D effort. They're hiring veterinarians right and left, both pathologist and laboratory animal medicine people. And I, I, I think that's where the future is. The, fu the future is to get into an arena that allows the veterinarian to be the liaison between the human side and the animal side. How you accomplish that, there's probably many, a lot of choice, choices. You might, maybe your strong point's toxicology and uh, pathology, and, and the marriage of those two as it relates to molecular science. Um, there's a, there are a lot of needs out there, but if veterinary schools don't keep abreast of the importance of genetics and ways to track genes and involvement with gene therapy, then they're going to lose out. I had a meeting this week with uh, one of the strongest leaders in Baylor College of Medicine involved with gene therapy. I've worked with him for almost seven years. He's a superb scientist, and he runs the Quality Assurance Laboratory for the Viral Vector Program. And uh, he made that comment that they have products that they would like to test in veterinary medicine you know, a product that treats a viral disease or a, a product that treats a viral-induced neoplasm or, you know, lots lots of mm -hmm. interaction. And he said that he has a hard, very hard time identifying veterinary schools or veterinary practices that will work with them. And I think part of that is because some of the veterinarians are, don't, aren't well trained in molecular anything. So, you know, I, I think veterinary medicine from time to time goes through little bursts of growth, and this is the time to do that. I think, I think gene therapy could be a commonly used treatment for animal disease in the next 10 years. I would agree with that. I think that the whole trend is, is going to be towards um, transgenic food animals as well. That's I mean, true. We're, gonna, we're going, we've already done it to, to vegetables and, and to, to our rodent populations mm -hmm. for fish. For, for Yes, transgenic fish. So it's it's uh, exploding. I, I I wanted to. You've done an awful lot for the veterinary profession in terms of promoting our image, both as veterinarians, as lab animal medical people, as veterinary pathologists to our physician colleagues. I'd like for you to just to touch on that because you've done an awful lot to 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 project our image and 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 certainly you've you've elevated that image. I think in a lot of people's eyes. When I, when I was in pre-vet, I, I worked as a medical technologist at Hillcrest Medical Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I met a wonderful MD pathologist by the name of Dr. Leo Lobier. I believe he was Hungarian. Dr. Lobier was, had two very strong points. 
One, he was an international expert on brucellosis in humans. Interesting. So when I applied for that job as a pre-vet student, he just took me right under his arm. He also had a strong interest in leptospirosis, and we had human cases in, in that hospital while I was working there. In fact, I remember one that died of leptospira can, mm -hmm. Wiles disease. But Dr. Lobeer was also a, just a superb forensic pathologist. And he taught me a lot of what I still use today about how to do a proper necropsy or an autopsy. How to observe or be observant. How to read the health records. And you should always do that before you start the autopsy. But, uh, and then correlate the clinical signs with the, with the lesions that you may or may not have. As I got into veterinary school, I kept working there, and I became his, his deaner. And um, I learned cytology under him. So my, my background has been, from the very beginning, working in a human hospital and working in veterinary medicine at the same time. And for that, for that reason, I, I, I just naturally think that way. I'm, I'm comparative is, a, is a just the way I live. <laughs> <laughs> um, it also made me unafraid to deal with physicians because I was around them all the time. I mean, there's, there's a tendency for um, some veterinarians to be intimidated by physicians for reasons I'm not sure of because we certainly have similar educations and, and if anything, the same degree of effort went into the, obtaining our degree. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's, there is a, an inclination for some veterinarians to, to be, want to take a subservient role to a physician and uh, that's not good because it, there's, it's, it's, it's just not necessary. So in all my dealings, whether it be in the government, industry, or academia, I've tried to break those barriers down and to open up good lines of communication between the medical profession and the veterinary medical profession. And I've, I've never had any trouble doing that. You have to be uh, bold and assertive sometimes and believe in what you're doing, but uh, but I but but I've always been confident about what I'm doing because I'm a pretty decent pathologist, and um, I don't have any reason to play second fiddle to to a physician that doesn't know anything about animal disease. And um, most of the time, if you try to open up those doors, they'll they'll admit real quick, "Gee, I'm glad that you you're, I'm glad you came to talk to me because I don't know anything about." It the differences in lung function between the different animal models. The, the best relationships, usually, in, a, in, a, in that type of environment, are the, are the relationship between the veterinarians and pediatricians. Pediatric medicine is probably the closest thing to veterinary medicine there is, because the patient can't tell you where they hurt. You have to do good physical examinations and rely on uh, clinical pathology and and hands-on with the patient, and the patient can't tell you where they hurt, and a lot of times a dog can't either. So the veterinarian develops skills using their senses of touch and smell and hearing and, and seeing that a pediatrician also uses. If you, it's if you're if you're coming into a new medical or coming into a medical school that does not have veterinar veter any veterinarians on the staff, that's your first ally, is to go to the pediatric department and work up some type of a, a relationship with them first, and then they'll they'll tell everybody else. Uh, Debater is a very interesting place in that uh, surgery has never been a part of the Center for Comparative Medicine because DeBakey, when he came there, set up an experimental surgery laboratory 
and it's still in existence. And and I, I wasn't about to compete with Dr. DeBake. Um, he's a wonderful person, and he's done outstanding things for the medical and veterinary medical profession. So, but he has needs. He d he didn't have a pathologist on his staff, and I do all his bovine pathology. So they, there's always a need there. It's just it's getting your foot in the door and finding you know, the best mechanism to provide the support that the school needs. And once that happens, then they'll just break your door down trying to get to you. May I, let me ask, uh, Dr. Montgomery, let me ask your thoughts on, because of the, the broad field of veterinary pathology, to include the, the pharmaceutical, the agricultural, mm -hmm. the genetic, the animal model, the, the question of, of specialization in, in veterinary pathology, what, just, have, just have your thoughts on it. Uh, you mean as far as subboards? As subboards. Um, I have mixed emotions about that. There, I, I can understand the, the delineation between anatomic and clinical pathology, because those, those really are different. But to be, have boards as a toxicologic pathologist or a laboratory animal pathologist, a molecular pathologist, I don't see anything wrong with having professional organizations that, spe that concentrate on the specialty of, but I do have a problem with having a different type of board for those people. We all need to be generalists. That's true. And I believe, and, and, and I, I and that's important because, uh, you know, I used to I used to use this an analogy that that if if you were allowed to be an equine practitioner before you graduated from veterinary school, and a horse kicked you so bad that you couldn't practice with horses anymore, you need a backup. So that being small animal medicine, mm -hmm. or a, become an avian pathologist, or whatever turns you on, but but. For that reason, I, I've been a strong supporter that veterinary students need to be generalists the day they get their DVM in their hand so that they can communicate with their colleagues, for one thing, in all, in all areas of veterinary medicine, and also uh, in case of emergencies, like illnesses. Right now, there's a, a real shortage of veterinary pathology residents throughout the country. All of the schools are experiencing this shortage. And Part of it's funding, but that's coming back. Comparative pathology and spe specifically mouse pathology is a very hot area of interest right now by Dr. Barmas at the National Institute of Health, and um, rightfully so. If you look at the number of animals that are being produced, the NABR survey that just came out gave all these figures, and the last thing it said down at the bottom said, these figures will double or triple in two to five years. Mm. We're already up to 18 million rodents per year. So can you imagine how many pathologists we'll need if that triples? Quite a few. And the veterinary medicine needs to take the initiative here. Um, I'm not saying that physicians can't read animal slides as a pathologist, but they have to be retrained. It'd be easier to take a veterinarian who's already got that, a background in animals, and then train them to be a mouse pathologist. Um, and I think we're gonna see that. We're gonna see, now that degree of subspecialization is gonna occur, because it, everything's based on supply and demand. And I know some people in the pharmaceutical industry or in toxicology feel a little um, threatened by some of that. But they're not, those people aren't gonna be keep com necessarily competing for the same jobs. There's a real need for uh, providing that good support for academic institutions. In the, in the few remaining minutes that we have for this interview, I'd, I'd just like to ask you if, if you could just kind of reflect back on your 
life both as a veterinary pathologist and as a lab animal medicine uh, practitioner and it gave us a sense of uh, your whole perspective of, of the field and of the military if you will I don't know if that's too too comprehensive but it's been you've had such a I won't say checkered life I've had a checkered life you've <laughs> had an illustrious life you've had a good but uh, you've done so much and you've done so much in the fields uh, over the years that I don't know if you could just sum it up in a, in a couple of sentences or well I've been blessed my whole life and um, I guess my dad taught me a long time ago that you kind of go where opportunity knocks and I've always been blessed with the ability to kind of foresee the needs that were coming down the pike and be willing to, and flexible enough to give up something I'm already doing that's successful and go in the direction of the future. And if you look at my career, that's what I've done. Uh, a real good friend of mine talked to me on the telephone just a week ago and said, I, you still amaze me that you can switch gears said, you're getting older, you know, I, and you're still switching gears. But I, um, it's, it's, you know, it's not like the movie Follow the Money, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's follow the science. And that's what I've tried to do. And I've been um, blessed with having worked with some really great people in my career. Paul Hildebrandt and uh, Dr. Garner. Dr. Gene McConnell, Dr. Sam Thompson. It's easy when you get people like that, you know, working on your side. Well, what's in the future for, for right now? For me? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to work about five more years. And uh, actually, I'm going to work about three more years full time and then start backing off. But, what's the uh, next book you're going to put out? I'm not going to ever write another book oh. except maybe a book like James Harriet wrote. Okay. And, and I might write kind of a fiction but use an autobi autobiographical approach. But uh, I've, I've always been tempted to write a book like that. But I, I, write, writing books is um, not as rewarding as writing scientific publications. You've got lots, many, many, well, well into the hundreds of scientific publications over the years. And well, I'm, I will, I will, I'm going to keep doing that. Uh, Genopath uh, is getting ready to take off, and uh, that's going to keep me pretty busy. I'll, I'll still probably work with Baylor for about two more years. And, uh, and there's a lot of bass out there to be caught. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> Are these large mouth or small mouth? Uh, I, 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 sh I, I show no preferential oh, treatment. I see. Uh, if it's a BASS, I, I try to catch it. Okay. But uh, I, I've just been introduced to uh, trips to the Yukon and catching pike on a fly rod, and that. That's I, an experience, I'm that's, sure. That's such a great experience. I think I'm going to try bone fishing in the Caribbean next year. Oh. But well, I you haven't. But you're still. You still got your hand in pathology. You're still very active. You're still teaching. Yeah. And and following the path. To I probably never better will. Science. I probably will never quit lecturing or giving, or teaching. I probably never will because working with young people keeps you young. Well, it's been a <laughs> real delight and an honor for me to interview you today, Dr. Charles A. Montgomery, Chuck Montgomery, as we know him. And uh, on behalf of the foundation, of which you've been an active member for many years, I want to thank you very much for, for coming to Washington and allowing us to question you and, and recounting your history mm -hmm. in veterinary pathology and lab animal medicine. And um, Thank you for inviting some of, me. Some of the bits and pieces of your life. Thank you very much, Dr. Montgomery. Thank you. Thank you. 